Hi everybody, today we're gonna to look at a multi-loop circuit. I've got a great circuit here for you. It's got three branches, got three batteries and three resistors. And the goal today is to calculate what the current is through each branch. So in order to do that, we're gonna use Kirchhoff's rules, the loop rule and the junction rule in order to set up equation and then solve for what the currents are. Before I do this, just wanna remind you, if you like the video, give it a like. If you don't like it, eh, just don't do anything. And if you really like the video and wanna learn more physics, uh, all kinds of different subjects, don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below. So with that being said, uh, let's get started on this problem. So this is what we've got. We've got three batteries. This is a 20 volt battery, 10 and a 30 volt battery. And we got these three resistors here, just kind of random numbers here, two, four and five ohms. And what we wanna do, we wanna find the current in each of the three resistors. Uh, the first thing to keep in mind here is, although you've probably learned about what an equivalent resistance is, for this problem here, you can't really combine these in series or in parallel, right? You might say, oh, both of these are in parallel. However, you can't because there are also batteries here. So that actually will not work. So you gotta be a little bit careful with this. Not, not all uh, circuits can be simplified using equivalent resistors like this. At least not in the traditional sense of using combinations of resistors in series and directly in parallel. So be careful, not in this problem. However, we can still solve it using Kirchhoff's rules. So in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by labeling all these points. And I'm just kind of arbitrarily going to call them A, B, C, D, E, and F. And I'm going to do this because when I'm going to start doing loops, I just want to identify which loops I'm doing, just so we're very clear. Now, two of these points here are actually even more specific. I'm going to actually make these blue. I need point A blue, and I'm also going to make point D blue. And at these points, I could apply what is called a junction rule. So how would you apply Kirchhoff's junction rule to these points? Well, Kirchhoff's junction rule tells you that whatever current flows into the junction has to be the current that flows out of the junction. Well, as it stands right now, there is nothing labeled on this diagram, so you can't even really write a junction rule. So step number one is you have to pick a direction for the current. Now you might say, well, how do I do that? Actually, it doesn't matter which direction you pick uh, for the junction rule. I've solved tons of these problems, so I think I got a pretty good idea what's gonna happen, especially here, look, there's a 20 volt battery. And again, this side here is the positive side, that's the negative side. And this one is stronger than the 10 volt battery. So I'm probably gonna guess that the current's gonna flow through here, and I'm gonna call this I1. Now over here, there's only one battery in this outer branch here. I'm gonna guess that the current here is gonna flow over here and I'm gonna call it something different. It's not going to be the same current. This is gonna be current I3 in this outer branch. And the one down the middle, I don't know, I'm gonna guess that it's gonna go down. And it doesn't matter if I was wrong or if I'm completely right. At the end, the solution will tell us whether or not our guess was correct or incorrect. So this is what I've got. So I've got three different branches to the circuit. Therefore, I need three different currents. And that's what I'm gonna to try to solve for. What are I1, I2, and I3? So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna write a junction rule. We're gonna write a junction rule at junction A. So at junction A, the junction rule says whatever flows in, let's see what goes in. Well, I1's going this way, I2's going down here. And it's looking, it's I3 that goes into the junction. I3. That has to be equal to whatever current flows out of the junction. So look what we have, we've got I1 that's flowing this way and I've got I2 flowing down in the center branch the way I've got it labeled here. So that means I3 must be equal to the current flowing out, which is I1 plus I2. That is the junction rule. Now you can go ahead and say, well, what about this junction down over here? If I write the same expression, my junction rule for the junction down here at point D, what am I gonna find? What's flowing into the junction? I have I1 flowing into the junction and I also have I2 flowing into the junction, which is this term over here, the second term on the right-hand side of my first equation. And what else? What's flowing out of the junction here at point D? Well, it's the current I3. I3 is flowing down this lower section over here and that is the current I3, which is the same everywhere in this kind of outer branch over here. So actually you get the same expression whether you choose this point or that point to write the junction rule. All right, the next thing we wanna do now is we wanna write uh, the loop rule, Kirchhoff's loop rule. Um, so the loop rule 
It's pretty simple. You simply have to pick loops. In this case, there are three loops I can actually choose for this circuit. And we'll write it down for all three. So I'm going to start with the loop that starts at point A, B, C, D, and then goes back to A. A, B, C, D, and then I'm going to go back to A. If I choose that loop and I sum all the voltages across the batteries and across the resistors and I come back to the same point, the loop rule says you sum all of those potential differences across every single element. You come back to where you start. At the end, there should be no change in electrical potential. So let's start over here at point A and I'm going to cross a battery. When you cross a battery, when I go from the negative to the positive, I get a voltage gain equal to the voltage of the battery. Now I'm going to cross a two ohm resistor and I'm going to cross it in the direction of the current that I've picked. So that means if the current's flowing from the top to the bottom, that means this side here is at a higher potential than a low one. So that means there's a potential drop across that resistor and that's given by Ohm's law. And that's simply the resistance times the current. The current is I1 flowing through there. All right, now I'm right over here at point C. I'm gonna cross a battery now. I'm gonna cross a battery from the high potential to the low potential, so I get a voltage drop. Whenever you get a voltage drop, you put a negative sign, minus 10 volts. Now I'm at the same potential all the way till I get over here. All right, now look what happens over here in the center branch. I'm going from point D to point A. I am crossing a resistor However, look what's going on here. If the current is flowing, the positive current is flowing from the top to the bottom here, and I'm doing my loop rule in a way that I'm going from point D to point A, that means that I'm going from a low potential to a higher potential. When you do that, you have to have a positive sign here, and the positive voltage gain that you're gonna get here when I'm doing my loop rule is given by Ohm's law, it's the value of the resistance, multiplied by the current flowing through it. That's it, I go back to point A, there we go. So let's call the junction rule equation one. I'm gonna call this equation two. Now let's go ahead and maybe do another loop rule. Another loop rule I can do now is using the loop A, D, E, F, and then go back to A. So let's do that one. A, D, uh, E, F, and then go back to A. What does that loop rule look like? Again, so here I'm actually going around counterclockwise around this loop. So when I start from A and I go down to D, look what happens now in this case. I'm crossing this four ohm resistor. However, I'm crossing it and I'm going in the same direction as the current. That means I'm going from a higher potential to a lower potential. That means I gotta get a voltage drop given by four times I2. That's Ohm's law written for this resistor. Then I go all the way to the battery. I'm gonna cross a battery now from the low potential to the high potential and there's a potential difference equal to 30 volts. I gain 30 volts when I cross that battery. And then at the end here, I'm gonna cross this five ohm resistor. I cross a five ohm resistor going in the same direction as the current, which means there's a voltage drop given by Ohm's law, which is five times. That's the value of the resistance multiplied by the current flowing through it. Be careful here, this is I3 that's flowing through that resistor. I go back to point A, that has to be zero. This is equation three. Now I could have done another loop. I could have done this big exterior loop here. What would we call that one? We call that one A, B, uh, C, D, uh, E, F, <laughs> and back to A. We've gone through every single point here going around this exterior loop. Well, the first three terms are gonna look exactly like they do in equation two. So here you have to have plus 20, you have to have minus two times I1, you have to have minus 10, all right, those are the first three terms. And then what do I do? And then I go over the 30 volt battery, that's plus 30. And then I go through this five ohm resistor, similar to what I did for equation three. I have to have a voltage drop here equal to five I3. Uh, equal to zero, and that is equation four. Now there are only three unknowns in this problem. The three unknowns in this problem are I1, I2, and I3, if you did a little bit of algebra, you should know that if you have three unknowns, all you need are three equations in order to solve this. We have four equations. We actually have too much information. <laughs> actually, it turns out that equation four, you would get equation four if you actually simply added equation two to equation three, and you can check that out for yourself. 
This is simply equation two plus equation three. So equation four basically doesn't give us any additional information because it's simply the sum of two other equations. You see if I sum both of those equations, what's gonna happen? In this equation here, you have four I two. In this equation, you have minus four I two. If I sum both of those up, those I two terms are gonna vanish and then I'll be left with equation four. So in order to solve this now, all we're gonna do is we're gonna use equation one equation two, and equation three. And at this point, the problem is all algebra. I've taken care of all the physics simply by writing down the junction rule, by labeling the currents in each branch, and by using the loop rule uh, in order to obtain these algebraic expressions. So let's set them up now and solve for the unknowns and see what the currents are. Okay, in order to solve for this now here, I've rewritten my three equations, so my junction rule and then my two Kirchhoff's loop rules here. Let me work with equation two and three and kind of simplify those a little bit. Basically, what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna try to eliminate I2 and I3 from the top equation. And I can do that simply by eliminating I2 from equation two. And that you can do simply by isolating the current I2 here. So how would that look like? You'd have four I2. And now if I bring everything else on the, other, on the other side, what are you gonna end up with? You're gonna end up with uh, two times I1. What else? And here you're gonna have 20 minus 10 gives me 10. If I bring that on the other side, it's gonna be minus 10, which means that at the end of the day, if I divide through by four, I'm gonna get that the current I2 is simply gonna be I1 divided by two minus if I can simplify that, it's 10 over four, uh, it's five over two, 2.5. All right, there's an expression now for the current I2 only in terms of I1. Now let's go ahead and simplify the current I3, do something similar over here. If I bring the five I3 on the other side, I get five I3 equals to 30 minus uh, four times I2. I wrote three, I meant to say four. Okay, now we can do a little bit more algebra here uh, in order to simplify this. This here is simply equal to 30 minus, let's get rid of I2 altogether. I can get rid of I2 by substituting the expression I just got up here. This is I1 over two minus five over, uh, five over two. All right, so we're almost done here. Just do a little bit more algebra here. This is 30. And this here, if I multiply through, what am I gonna get? I'm gonna get minus two I1 over here, I'm gonna get, what's gonna be left with? Uh, plus 10. Okay, so at the end, my expression for I3, remember here I had five I3, so really at the end, I gotta divide through by five. So what are we left with? We're gonna get uh, 30 plus 10 gives me 40, minus two I1. And I can't forget to divide by five. So this here simplifies nicely to eight, minus two over five I1. All right, so we have two important expressions here. We have I2 simply in terms of I1, and I have I3 here in terms of I1. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to our junction rule, and we're gonna substitute in the expressions for I2, then I3, and then we're only gonna be left with an equation for I1, and I'll be able to solve that current. So let's go ahead and do that. So that means we're gonna have I1, Plus, instead of I2 here, let's substitute our expression. This is I1 over two minus five over two. That there has to be equal to I3. I3 is eight minus two fifths multiplied by I1. All right, look at this expression over here. There's only I1 is the only unknown in this expression. So let's go back. Let's group all the I1 terms together. This is what it looks like. You have I1 plus I1 over two, and bring this term on the other side, what are you gonna get? You're gonna get plus two fifths I1. That there must be equal to eight plus, there's this term over here, five over two, if I bring, bring it to the other side. All right, at the end, we have to put everything on a common denominator, that kind of helps. Um, I could choose 10 here as a common denominator for this side. That here means I'm left with 10 uh, plus five plus four. All of this gets multiplied by I1. And here, if I put things on a common denominator, 
you're going to get 16 plus 5 uh, divided by 2. All right, so nearing the end over here, this side, uh, what do we get? We're going to get 19 over 10 multiplied by I1. And this side here gives me 21 over 2. So we can factor out a 2 on each side. We're going to be left with 5. So the final expression now for I1, you have to bring the 5 over on this side, and you have to divide through by 19. It gets a little bit long. You've got to be careful here. So 5 times 21 gives me 105. And divide it by 19. Here is the current for uh, the branch I1, which I had labeled as this one over here. This was the current I1 here. Right, 105 divided by 19. All right, I've solved now for uh, I1. Let me just kind of make some room here. So we don't really need all this algebra here anymore. We know what the value of I1 is. Now what I want to do is I want to solve for what I2 and I3 are given the value of I1. Now you could just substitute stuff in your calculator. Uh, if you do that, you should get that I1 here. Uh, 5.526 amps approximately. All right, so now let's go ahead and find I2. So I2, all you have to do is simply substitute the value of I1 here. Now that <laughs> fractions get a little bit messy, but it's kind of good to just play around with those things. So you get 105 uh, divided by 19. And that there, don't forget, is divided by 2. So you still need that 2 there. And minus 5 over 2. Okay, so what can I do to simplify this a little bit? Um, that's 105. Um, 19 times 2. Oops, that's 38. That one I can do in my head. All right, and how do I put this on a uh, factor of 38? You have to multiply both sides by 19. All right, that'll put this on 38. If I do the top times 19, I should get 95. <laughs> so at the, at the end, you're left with 10 over 38, uh, which is also 5 over 19. All right, that's the current I2. How about I3? Well, I3 now is simply 8. Uh, minus two-fifths, and I1, again, is 105 uh, over 19. Uh, the 5 I can get rid of, and I can factor out. This should be 21. So what are you left with now? You're going to be left with 8 minus 2 times 21 is 42 over 19. Now, this gets really messy, but actually, uh, 8 times 19, well, 8 times 20 is very, very easy. That's 160. So this here should be 152 minus 42, and all of that is over 19. So here at the end, you're going to be left with 110 over 19. Actually, you could have probably guessed that one because you could have automatically just used equation 1 over here to obtain that because you know you have 1 over 5, uh, 105 over 19 here, and you have uh, I2, which we just found was 5 over 19. Therefore, I3 here has to be 110 over 19. Uh, you substitute numbers, and for this one, uh, 5 over 19 gives you 0 0.263 amps. And the last one, 110 over 19, doing everything approximately here, 5.5, uh, 5.789, I'm sorry. Let's correct that, 789 amps. So there you have it, folks. This is just kind of algebra at this point. Uh, once you have your three equations, you can pick any method you want in order to solve that. Um, I kind of did it my way. I kind of leave, like to leave things in fractions. It's kind of easy for me to check the answer actually after once I have everything on the common denominator. All right, folks, that's it for me. Uh, thanks for watching. Again, if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. See you next time.